So uh, Jeremiah chapter 24 is quite a short chapter, uh, if you compare it to the other chapters that are in the book of Jeremiah. Nonetheless, it's one of the more challenging ones. <laughs> if you've been paying attention, uh, God gives Jeremiah a vision there. But look at verse number 3, Jeremiah chapter 24, verse number 3. It reads, Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil. The title for the sermon this morning is Good Figs or Evil Figs. Good Figs or Evil Figs. Now, these figs basically represent the people of God. And as we're going through this, I want you to decide which one you want to be. Are you going to be the good fig or are you going to be the evil fig? Now, you might say, well, you know, I'm going to church, I'm going to soul winning, I read my Bible. Surely I'm a good fig. You know, I try to live a righteous life and a holy life. Surely I'm one of these good figs. But as we're going through the... And I'm glad if, if that's you, if that's what you think, I, I'm glad for that, you know. But when we look at this chapter, uh, the good figs actually represents... Or basically the, the differentiation between the good figs and the evil figs basically have to do with how the people responded with the Babylonian takeover, with the Babylonian captivity, Okay. So, you know, I'm glad, you know, if you're a soul winner in church, reading your Bible, serving the Lord, I'm glad for that, brethren. You are very fruitful then for the Lord if you're doing such things. But the context of the figs here is a slightly different take. It's how you respond to external uh, forces that are causing you or removing your rights, removing your privilege, privileges, all right, uh, in the land. And I think, again, this is re very relevant to the time we're in. Okay? As we've been going through Jeremiah, I think we've seen a lot of parallels with Australia. I think we've seen a lot of parallels with God's judgment. We've seen a lot of parallels with your rights and your freedoms being removed uh, during this time. And, and I expect as time goes on, further removal of our rights and, and privileges will be taken away. You know? And so we pay attention to this. And I want you to conclude to say, hey, I want to be one of these good figs. And as I said, it is one of the, it's, it's a very challenging chapter, okay? Because your natural response, my natural response in the time of Jeremiah would be to be an evil fig, okay? Let's look at verse number one, Jeremiah chapter 24, verse number one. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. So I want you to notice this. I, I don't know if this is a, a vision. Okay, that God has given him a supernatural vision. Or Jeremiah is passing by the temple of the Lord and he sees these baskets of figs being put there, uh, you know, and the Lord's, you know, pointing him to this. All right. But I want you to notice where these figs, where these baskets of figs are located. Where are they located? They're set before the temple of the Lord. This is important, okay, to understand what is being referenced here. So the temple of the Lord is the house of the Lord. Okay. So if we want to take this for us in 2021, then we ought to be thinking about Blessed Hope Baptist Church because our church is the house of the Lord. You know, your, your local church is the house of the Lord. And so these two baskets of figs represent God's people. The good figs, the evil figs, they represent those that are set in the house of the Lord. Now notice this. It says, after that, Nebuchadrezzar, now remember Nebuchadrezzar is the same, is the same person as Nebuchadnezzar, all right? Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, son of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. So this chapter begins by giving us the, <coughs> the time frame of, of this uh, judgment, this captivity that's come. Now, a, a new name that's been introduced to us here uh, is Jeconiah. Jeconiah. But this is not the first time we hear of King Jeconiah in, 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 uh, in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 2, you, you may remember that we came across the name Coniah. Remember King Coniah? Well, well Jeconiah, Je, which just has J-E in front of it, Jeconiah is Coniah. Okay, but another name that we were, uh, you know, as we were going through Jeremiah chapter 22, I was explaining to you how these kings had multiple names. Okay, and the name that we're most common uh, or most associated with this king is the, is the name Jehoiakim. Okay, remember you might recall Jehoiakim, who was the father, and Jehoiakim is the son. Well, Jehoiakim also has two other names in Jeremiah: Coniah and Jeconiah. It's the same guy. Okay, just so you understand the, the time frame of this. And so, what we're looking at here is is Jeconiah, okay, or Jehoiakim 
already been taken into captivity, and not just him, it says the princes of Judah, carpenters, smiths, so people that have, you know, have skills, okay? So Babylon, hey, we need carpenters, we need smiths, get those kinds of people to come into our land uh, from Jerusalem, right? And brought them to Babylon. So when we look at the captivity of, of Judah in the days of Babylon, there were two, two main exiles that took place, okay? The first main exile took place here with Jeconiah or Jehoiakim, all right? And that's the first one that came into, you know, people were being taken into the, the, the lands and the countries of, of Babylon. And then we have a second one, which is in the time of Jeconiah, uh, sorry, Zedekiah. So Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. And Zedekiah, he rebels against uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar comes in. They take basically all the people into captivity or, or, or they're killed in the battle. And that's basically the end of Judah. Okay, so there are, two, there are kind of two major exiles that took place. So the time frame of this chapter is when the first exile took place. Okay, so certain people are already being taken into Babylon. Now, I want you to remember this because we, as these people, we are losing our freedoms. You know, we are losing our rights, you know, especially in this COVID world. Now, I don't know whether we're going to retain some of the things that, you know, our nation, uh, the people of this world have given up. You know, I, I don't know whether they'll ever come back, you know. Uh, but one thing I want you to just uh, understand, you know, first of all, I'm not saying that things are as bad as the time of Babylon. I mean, if you're losing your house, if you're losing your family, if, if people you know around you are dying, okay, at the hands of, of the government or, or external powers that may be, then yeah, maybe we can draw a closer parallel to the time of Jeremiah. But what I want us to do is take the principles, take the lessons that we see here and apply in our situation. Because for a lot of us, you know, the COVID world, for a lot of us anyway, is, is probably the, one of the biggest events that we're going to have in our life. You know, there are other generations that have gone through world wars, right? World War II, World War I. Those are major times. And, you know, there was obviously much greater deaths uh, during that time, much greater changes to the world during those events. Uh, we've not gone through anything like this. Basically, for my generation, this would be one of the biggest things that we've seen in our lifetime. And so I don't want to leave you without uh, direction. You know, I don't want to leave you with, with uh, being unstable or not, showing, not sure how we respond or react as Christians. Because, again, there's nothing new under the sun. Okay? Whatever situation we're in, you're going to find a story in the Bible and God will teach us how we ought to respond to that situation. We see here people are being taken into captivity. Now they're losing their rights. They're losing their freedoms. Well, we've seen that. And, and what we also see here, because there were two major exiles... You know, we may see, you know, uh, th uh, things develop over the years where we lose more and more of what we've become used to. You know, we lose more and more of the normality that we're used to. I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen, but I'm just saying if it does happen, I want you as a Christian to come back to the book of Jeremiah and remind yourself of the things that you've learned. Okay? Now... Why is this important? You may say, well, Pastor Kevin, come on. This is the time of Judah. This was thousands of years ago, right? How can we apply that to Australia today? Don't forget in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, I'll just read it to you. Uh, Jeremiah says, before I sorry, God says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Remember that. That's in chapter 1. So as soon as we start the book of Jeremiah, we read, okay, this is about Judah, this is about Babylon, yeah, I understand. But don't forget, Jeremiah is a, been ordained by God to be a prophet unto the nations, plural. That means the Gentile nations. That means Australia. All right? So we read this. Don't, don't just think, oh, this is history. Okay? No. These are real life events. These are real people. This is real history. This stuff really happened. And God has recorded it for us in the Bible so we can learn thereby. Okay? So let's never have that idea, well, this is just about the past. No, you need to apply this to the now. Just a reminder there in verse number one, two baskets of figs, all right? Before the temple of the Lord, the house of the Lord, this represents God's people. Okay? We, both, both baskets represents God's people. Verse number two. Verse number two. It says, one basket had very good figs, 
even like the figs that are first ripe. And the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Actually, there was one more thing that I wanted to mention in verse number one before we look at verse number two. Don't forget these people that have been exiled. Okay? They're losing their access to the temple of God. They're losing their access to the house of God. Okay? And again, think about what happened in 2020. You know, for was it, was it six weeks, we lost access, roughly or six, six to eight weeks, I can't remember right now, we lost access to the house of the Lord. Okay? We lost that privilege for a period of time. Now, I want you to just be you know, thinking about these things in terms of what we're seeing here. There's a reason why these figs are before the temple of the Lord. Okay? Now, in one basket, there are very good figs, ripe figs. Okay? Um, it's my mum's favorite fruit. Okay? I think fig is actually classified as a flower. Okay? But it's one of her favorites. And you can see hey, when they're ripe, they're sweet, they're juicy, they're delicious. And not only are they uh, very sweet, but they're light on the stomach. If, you, if you've eaten figs, you, you could eat several figs in one hit. Okay? And so that's one basket that represents those delicious figs. They can be eaten. They're sweet. Okay? It represents the fruitfulness of the fig. But then there's another basket of figs which has very naughty figs. Now, you, when you think of naughty figs, you might think of, uh, you know, ill-disciplined. But naughty, if you just uh, consider the word, remove the Y for a moment, what, what do you get if you remove the Y from naughty? Naught. Zero. Okay? That's what it means here. Naughty means zero. Zero value. Zero nutrition. They cannot be eaten. It's a waste. Okay? There's no value in these figs which cannot be eaten because they're so bad. All right, let's keep going. Verse number three. As I said, these figs don't represent your Christian life right now. It represents your response to the Babylonian captivity. All right? Now, obviously, if these figs have become so bad, they've become... What's the word? Sorry. They've, they've, gone, they've gone bad. So that they used to be ripe. They used to be figs that could be eaten. They used to be figs that had value, but they've been over-ripened. They've gone bad. They've gone off, okay? And they cannot be eaten, all right? Remember that. Verse number three. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. So we learn another thing about these naughty or bad figs, Jeremiah says that these figs are evil figs. Now again, evil doesn't necessarily mean wicked. All right? I mean, figs in of themselves are not wicked, even if they've gone bad. Okay? Evil in the Bible often has to do with the word being harm, harmful. Okay? So Jeremiah says, look, these figs are harmful. They're evil. If you eat of them, it's going to make you sick. It's going to harm your body. Okay? So that's what Jeremiah sees. Verse number four. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them, look at this, that are carried away captive of Judah. So what do the good figs represent? The people that have been carried away into captivity. You know, we want to be the good figs. God may allow you to be taken away into captivity. God may allow you to lose your liberties, your freedoms that you so desire. God says, well, those people are the good figs. Okay? Now, like I said, I, said, I told you, this chapter is challenging. Do you want to lose your liberties? Do you want to lose your freedoms? Do you want to be taken into captivity in some foreign nation where you don't know the language? You know, and basically, you're just, used, you're just to be used for the purpose of other people? No one wants that. Like, no, no one wants to lose your freedoms. and No one wants that, right? And this is why it's challenging. Because God says those people represent the good figs. Those people represent the sweet figs. Those people represent a fig that can be eaten, that can be used, that is useful to work for God. Okay? So this is what I want you to ch be challenged with. We live in an environment where you can actually apply this okay, today. Before you get too nervous about what I'm going to preach. You know, we, we, we will stick to the biblical passages here. We'll definitely take the context directly from the story at hand. Okay? Let's keep going. Uh, it says there, So will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, 
whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans. Look at this. For their good. For their good. God says those people that have been taken away into captivity, into a foreign land, into the land of the Chaldeans, I'm doing it for their good. Brethren, when you're going through this time, this COVID land, this COVID world, okay, you're losing your liberties and you see your liberties being lost. You see your access to church being uh, restricted. You know what? I want you to stop and say, you know what? I want to be one of these good figs. God, how are you going to use this for my good? That's what you should be asking yourself. Okay? How are you going to be using this? Lord, I see in Jeremiah, you use this for good. I want it to be for my good. Keep your finger there and please turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. Nobody wants to be taken into captivity. Nobody wants to lose their freedoms. But it can be for our good, brethren. It could be. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 1 for me, please, and verse number 1. <coughs> because maybe in your minds, you think, well, surely the people that were extremely wicked, they were taken into captivity. Surely people that hated God. And yeah, you know what? Israel or Judah here was made up of saved and unsaved people. We, we've seen this already as we're going, going through Jeremiah. But you know, even saved people are being taken into captivity. You know, even great men of God, great people of God are being taken into captivity. They're losing all their freedoms. Okay? Ezekiel chapter 1, verse number 1. And it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I, this is Ezekiel, was among the captives by the river of Keba, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. So it's that first exile that's taken place here. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Keba. In the hand of the Lord was there, sorry, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. So who got taken into captivity as Jeremiah is preaching these things? The priest Ezekiel. Now, you may have thought that the house of God was full of evil, wicked people. No, there were still godly people there. Ezekiel was a priest that's trying to serve the Lord, even amongst the corruption that's taking place in the temple of the Lord. And the Lord allows him to be taken into captivity. Okay, But we, what we saw, it was, for his, it was for his good. Hey, he receives visions of God. The Bible tells us the hand of the Lord is upon Ezekiel. And Ezekiel writes a great portion of the Bible. God used him in a great way. Can you please turn to Esther, chapter 2? Turn to Esther, chapter 2. Esther. I'll give you a moment to turn there. I think these are important to look at. If you can turn there to Esther, chapter 2. <coughs> Esther, chapter 2. And verse number 5. You guys are probably familiar with the story of Esther. Esther, chapter 2, and verse number 5. Now in Shushan... The palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. And basically, if you know the book of Esther, Mordecai is the hero. Or Esther as well, okay? But Mordecai plays a great role in delivering the Jews from certain death, okay? So there's this Jew named Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite. Look at this, verse number 6. Who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconiah, so you can see Jeconiah is mentioned there, Jehoiakim was mentioned in Ezekiel, same king, with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. So another great man of God was taken into captivity. This guy is not, you know, a priest. He's a Benjaminite. He's just a good believer. He's just a good man of faith. He's just a, a good person, all right, that God would use in a powerful way and guess what else? What his fate was to be carried away into captivity as well. Say, so, oh God, how could you allow these people to be taken? It was for their good. God had a purpose for these people. You know, having all their rights and their freedom stripped away, God still had a purpose. God's hand was still on these people. Can you please turn to Daniel chapter 1? Daniel chapter 1. These people are, of course, more common to us, more familiar to us. Daniel chapter 1, please. <laughs> <coughs> Daniel chapter 1 
Daniel chapter 1 and verse number 1. Daniel chapter 1, verse number 1. We know that Daniel is one of the main, of course, it's his book, uh, one of the main characters. And boy, it's hard to find a more faithful person than Daniel in the Bible. You know? But Daniel chapter 1, verse number 1 reads, In the thir third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, so not only was this captivity being taken place, but the, the things that make up the house of God are being taken away as well. Which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish but well favoured, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years. And at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now look at verse number 6. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, we know Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So you've got three other names there, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. If you don't know who they are, verse number 7 says, Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and of Mishael of Meshach, and of Azariah of Abednego. So you might be familiar with more of those names. Those are the three that were cast into the furnace of fire for not bowing down and worshipping the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So we have four great men, Daniel and his three friends. Guess what? They were also taken into captivity okay, during this time. So, so far we've seen Daniel, his three friends, Ezekiel, Mordecai. What are we seeing? We've seen great people of God that God has allowed to be taken into captivity to lose their freedoms, to lose their rights, to lose their access to the house of God. And God says it was for their good. I'm doing it for their good. How do we apply that today? We are losing our freedoms, brethren. Okay, We are losing our rights. We have lost our access to the house of God. But I want you to pause and say, you know what, God? This was for our good. This is for our good. I want you to take the lessons of Jeremiah and say, Lord, the way I'm going to respond in this crazy world that we live in is to respond the same way great people of God respond in the days of Jeremiah, in the days of the Babylonian cap captivity, in the days of the Babylonian takeover. I'm going to respond in the same way, God, because I want to be one of these good figs. I want to be nutritious in value. I want to be able to be used of you, God, and I want you to do something good in me. I don't know what may happen. I don't know what the future may hold. And again, I don't say this to, to, to cause fear or alarm. What I want from this, brethren, is to just prepare yourself. We may see a secondary loss of rights, of privileges. We may see a complete takeover of everything we know that we're used to, the normality that we're used to. How are you going to respond? Are you going to be one of the good figs or are you going to be one of the evil figs? You know, think about this. Apply this to your situation. You know, God's word is timeless. God's word is a spiritual book. It's applicable today just as much as it is applicable in the days of Jeremiah. Back to Jeremiah, please. Back to Jeremiah. <coughs> chapter 24 and verse number 6. Jeremiah chapter 24 and verse number 6. God says... For I will set mine eyes upon them for good. But notice the next words. And I will bring them again to this land. And I will build them and not pull them down. And I will plant them and not pluck them up. Again, what is the purpose of them being taken into captivity? That God will do good upon them. His eyes are upon them for good. Brethren, you're losing. If we lose more and more of our rights, our privileges, if we lose our access to church, I'm not talking about this building. You know, I'm trying to fix up this building as best as we can because I want it to be a comfortable place where we come and worship the Lord. I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about church, the people of God being gathered together 
we may lose our privileges, our rights to, to meet the way we want to meet, brethren. It may happen. But I want you to remind yourself, what does God say here in verse number 6? For I will set mine eyes upon them. God's eyes are going to be upon us for good. God can take a situation even like that and make it for good. Okay, for good purposes. The Bible tells us, very familiar passage to all of you, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Please uh, keep your finger there in Jeremiah and turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And then when, you, when you've turned to 1 Peter chapter 5, come back to Jeremiah 24. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. And then go back to Jeremiah 24 and verse number 6. Let's read it again. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land. So God does promise that those are the good figs that He's going to bring them back into the land. Okay? We know that there was a 70 year uh, captivity that took place in Babylon before they started to come back and started to rebuild the city, rebuild the temple, all these kinds of things. But God continues saying, I will build them. You say, Pastor Kevin, are you upset that in 2020 we had to shut down our church for six weeks or whatever it was? I'm not. I don't have a heavy conscience. I have a perfectly clear conscience for doing that. You know, Pastor Kevin, are, are you concerned that, you know, you've asked us to wear the mask when it was being mandated across all of Sydney? I have a clear conscience, completely clear conscience. You know why? Because God says that his eyes are upon us and it's going to be for our good. There are lessons to be learned during these days, during these times. Okay? And if that means we have to give up some of our liberties, we give them up. I want to be a good fig. I want you to be a good fig. But it's your choice. It's your call. Okay? God says, I will build them and not pull them down. And I will plant them and not pluck them up. What is God saying? You're going to be stronger. You're going to be planted. You're going to be further rooted in God's word, in your Christian faith. If you put up with these challenges, if you put up with these difficulties, if you put up with captivity, God's going to make you a stronger person. A good fig. A fig that can be eaten. That can be useful for God. That is sweet to the taste of God. Okay? Look at, uh, go back there to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 10. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 10. It says, But the God of all grace, who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, look at this, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. You want to be perfect, complete? You want to be established? You want to be strengthened? You want to be settled? You know what you're going to have to go through? A bit of suffering. A bit of hardships, okay? Maybe captivity. Maybe the loss of everything you have, the loss of everything you own. That could happen, okay? But I want you to respond, not woe is me. I want you to respond, God, your eyes are upon me and you're going to use this for my good. You're going to strengthen me. You're going to establish me. And Lord, I'm unsettled right now. You're going to settle me, is what we saw in 1 Peter chapter 5. Back to Jeremiah 24, please. Verse number 7. Jeremiah 24 and verse number 7. That's not the only thing God's going to do if you want to be one of these good figs. Verse number 7. And I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. What a great promise. You know what? I don't know what powers are right now, what the wicked powers that are in this world, removing our rights, removing our privileges, taking advantage of this COVID situation to further their agendas. We know that ultimately it's going to lead to the Antichrist and his kingdom, okay, things that come. Again, put yourself in this position, all right? You know what? I'm going to go through some hardships and some challenges, lose some privileges. But you know what? God's going to give me a heart to know him. How, much, how well do you know God? 
How well do you know God? Well, God's saying, I'm going to give you a heart to know me further. You know, one of my great desires in my life is just to know God. And the more I know God, the happier I am. You know, the more pleased I am, the more I know God, you know. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return unto me, look at this, with their whole heart. You know what this tells me? As we're losing our rights and our, the things, that, the normalities that we're used to, you know, it, it may very well be that we're not seeking God with our whole hearts. Maybe you have a, a great heart for the Lord, but maybe it's, it's 80% on the Lord and, and 20% on this world. Maybe it's 90% on the Lord, but 10% on this world. Maybe your, your heart is still in this, this world. You know, I've, I've preached previously that just, just seeing the corruption of this world is causing me to just loosen any kind of attachments that I have to this world. Okay? And then I look at this and I go, well, God, you've got your purpose behind that. Because you want us to pe be people that return unto you with our whole hearts. That we love you 100% with our hearts. That we don't love a portion of this world and, and uh, you know, that, that we give up on this world and say, Lord, you can have it all. It's, it, my money, my possessions, my homes, the, everything that I have in this world, it's useless when it comes to you and your kingdom and your heaven, your home, your mansion, the streets of gold, salvation, knowing that I can be with you for all eternity. Whatever I have in this world, Lord, is worthless compared to the great promises that you've given me. And Lord, you know, it may very well be that God allows us to go through these difficulties, that we can just come to God with a whole heart, that we can serve Him and know Him better than we've ever known Him before. Can you please turn to uh, Psalm 119? Keep your finger there in, Jer in Jeremiah 24. Please go to Psalm 119. You guys probably know Psalm 119 as the longest psalm there is. <coughs> and while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians 6.16. 2 Corinthians 6.16 which says, And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? Then it says these words, pay attention. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Brethren, if you're saved today, God says about you that He will dwell in you, and that He will be your God, and you will be His people. That's exactly what God said about those that have been taken into captivity. In Jeremiah 24, verse 7, it said, And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. So when we see these parallels that he's speaking about us, who does God want us to be? He wants us to be the people that have been taken into captivity. Okay? He wants us to be those good figs. He wants us to be the people that say, Well, Lord, I'm losing everything. I'm not really liking this, but I know your eyes are upon me, and I know you're going to do good unto me. I know you mean well for me, Lord. I know you're going to strengthen me. But we saw that God is calling us to be people that return unto him with a whole heart. And when I think about this term, the whole heart, Psalm 119 talks about this topic the most. So let's look at verse number 2, Psalm 119 and verse number 2. It reads, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. So brethren, when we seek the Lord, God says, do it with your whole heart. Look at verse number 10. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. What else do we notice? When we come to the Lord with a whole heart, we're going to have a, 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 a desire to not wander from his commandments. A desire to live a more holy, blameless life. Look at verse number um, 58. Drop down to verse number 58. Same psalm, verse number 58. It says, I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. So when we come to the Lord and entreat of him, ask of him, we ought to be doing it with our whole heart. Drop down to verse number 69. It says, The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. So our desire to keep the, the, the laws of God, the precepts of God, ought to be coming from a place of a whole heart. 
Sometimes we can do what God wants us to do it, but we don't do it with our whole heart. We do it because oh, we know we need to do it, and we just do it, but our heart's not in it. You know, God wants our whole heart to be in service for Him. Drop down to verse number 145. Verse number 145. Same Psalm, 145. The Bible reads, I cried with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord. I will keep thy statutes. So when we cry before the Lord, when we go to Him for help, we ought to cry with our whole heart. You know, this just gives us an idea. This Psalm gives an idea how the Lord wants us to respond with a whole heart. To follow His ways, to keep His commandments, to love doing it, to come before Him in prayer with a whole heart. You know what? When we go through a time of difficulties and loss of, of freedoms and whatever, maybe loss of our access to church, God's going to build this in us. He's going to cause us to, to come before Him with a whole heart. Maybe sometimes we take church for granted. Maybe we took our liberties, our blessings for granted. And when we lose them, it brings us back to the knowledge of God and say, God, we need this back. And when they get returned back unto us, we come back with that whole heart. You know, appreciating what God has given us. Back to Jeremiah 24. Now, we saw that in Jeremiah's time, that were to be brought back. They would return with a whole heart. But I want you to keep something in mind as well. It was 70 years. All right? Many of the people, especially the adults, okay, that went into captivity would not come back. They would not return to the land. All right, so is God saying these things in vain? No, because we know the children and the grandchildren, we know the next generations came back and returned unto the Lord with a whole heart. Okay? Now, I, I, that's an important point to make. Because your decision of, of, of choosing to be a good fig or an evil fig has lasting consequences to your descendants, to your children, to your grandchildren. All right? Your decisions are going to have an effect. You know, I want my kids, you know, if, if we lose our rights and our access, whatever, you know, and, and I suffer for that, and I suffer with that for the rest of my life. Well, I know that if I desire to be this good fig, that my children are going to benefit from it. That my grandchildren are going to benefit from it. That we're going to be able to continue this lineage of, of a people that love the Lord. And one day they're going to be able to come and, and be able to return unto the Lord with a whole heart. They're going to be strengthened by the Lord. They're going to be used by God. They're going to be sweet to the taste of God. But what we'll soon see that if you choose to be one of these evil figs, all right, one of these figs that are bad, one of these figs that are naught, naughty, that you may lose your descendants. You may lose your children. Your children will not want to be in the house of the Lord. Your children will not want to continue this lineage you know, that God would, would have us to have. And so really, the choice is yours. You know? Your response has lasting effects or consequences on your descendants. Look at verse number 8. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Remember, think of the word harmful, okay? Surely thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes, and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt. I might read verse number 9. And I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt. These are the evil figs. For the good figs, it's for their good. For the evil figs, it's going to hurt them to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt, and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. Verse number 10. And I will send the sword and famine and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I give unto them and to their fathers. These are the evil figs. Now, let's look at verse number 8 again. Okay, so when we see, so I will give King Zedekiah, we're talking about the second, the, the second major exile that took place, okay, after King Jehoiakim. But notice, who are these people? Who are these evil figs? Who are these figs that are going to lose their lives? Okay? It says at the end of verse 8, that, uh, and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land. Now, if you know the history of the story here, okay, those that said, no, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to fight the king of Babylon. I'm going to fight this judgment to come. We're going to stay in Jerusalem. We're going to go to war. All right? Those that, 
They're the people that stayed in the land. That said, no, we're not going to take this. We're not going to lose our rights. We're not going to lose our freedom. We're not going to be taken into captivity. That's not going to be for us. And you can see where they're coming from. They mean well. They know this is their land. They know this is what's supposed to be an inheritance from God. They know that they received this land because of God's blessings. When God led, you know, the Israelites out of Egypt, right? But it's these people that God is calling for evil figs. The figs of no value. The figs that become harmful to those around them. Not only them. It says here, uh, at the end, that remain in the land, and look at this, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt. So then there was another group of people that said, you know what? Things are getting bad here. All right? Things are getting horrible here. We need to flee. And they flee to Egypt. Right? They don't stay in the land to fight. They know there's a problem. They don't decide, well, um, uh, you know, Jeremiah's been saying, you know, hand yourself to the captors. I'm not going to do that either. I don't want that. Rather, let's flee to Egypt. We'll be safe in Egypt. God says, nope, even them that dwell in the land of Egypt, there's coming this judgment. You're not going to flee. You're not going to, you know, escape this. Okay? These are the people that are the evil figs, the bad figs, the naughty figs. Okay? You know, this reminds me of a story when I was in primary school. I don't know how old I was, maybe 10. And uh, there, was a, there was a kid in my school uh, who had six, fing six fingers in one hand. Okay? So it was obviously a uh, genetic defect. And if I recall correctly, it was his little finger, and there was like another little finger coming out of the little finger. Okay? And, uh, you know, some of my friends, or I, I, don't, I can't remember if they were really my friends or just people in, you know, in my year, basically said, oh, you know, there's this kid with six fingers. Do you want to go and have a look? I was like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a, a child's curiosity. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd like to see that. That's unusual. That's different, right? And so we went to the, to the kid with the six fingers. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't trying to tease him or be rude. I was just curious. I, you know, I, think of a child's curiosity. That, that's the response that I had. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be mean to him. I wasn't there to make fun, you know. In fact, I felt sorry for him that he had this sort of, unusual uh, defect. But anyway, so a few of the kids, I don't know how many there were, maybe seven or eight of us, we got together, we just, you know, asking him, oh, can you show us your finger, whatever. There comes a teacher. All right, guys, all of you, you know, you got detention. This was during lunchtime or recess. You're in detention. It's like, what's it? Like, what, you know? And basically, you know, he's thinking that we're mocking him and teasing him. Maybe now as an adult, I look back and I think, yeah, obviously we shouldn't have done that. Okay? You know, trying, you know, but a child doesn't think that way, right? And so, you know, we're taken into captivity, as it were, right? A whole bunch of us, and he's leading us to some classroom. And, and you know, I'm just on, on the way to, to, as we're walking amongst this group, I'm thinking, all right, there's a whole bunch of us. He probably doesn't even know who I am. He's never been my teacher. Uh, and, uh, you, know, and I, you know, I don't believe in this justice. I, I don't deserve to be in detention during lunch. And uh, this isn't right. You know, I wasn't there to cause any problems. It wasn't even my idea to go and, and see this guy's finger. So, it, it's, you know, so what am I going to do? I'm going to escape. All right, so I'll never forget, we ran around the corner of a building, teachers walking with a whole bunch of kids, and I just stayed back. And I'm like, yes! And I, keep, I see them keep walking, they don't notice that I stayed back. It's like, yes! I got away from the judgment! You know, I escaped to Egypt! I'm going to be safe here! Well, never, you know, later on, after lunch when I was in class, that same teacher comes into my classroom, you know, pulls me aside. And I can't remember how, what I got in trouble, but basically, I got in more trouble than the kids that actually went into, you know, and just copped it. You know, I, I, got a, I got a bigger, uh, you know, correction. I can't remember what, what it was right now, but I learned a lesson there. <laughs> Sometimes it's better, even if it's not your fault, even if you think it's not justified, to just take the punishment that comes, <laughs> you know, we've just been there, you know, just being caught up, you know, in, in the mess. If you try to run away, there can come a greater judgment. We've seen the same thing happen here in Jeremiah. Those that decided, let's just get out of here, let's just run to Egypt. That's a good place to be. God says, no, your judgment. You know, wait, I'm going to send the sword, the famine, the pestilence. You're going to be consumed. You're going to be destroyed. You're not going to have descendants. You're not going to have children that are going to be able to return and come back to the Lord with a, with a whole heart. So this is what we learn in this story, brethren. I want you to be one of the good figs, not an evil fig. You know, as we lose these, these freedoms and access to church and, you know, your heart and, you know, my heart initially is to fight these things. To go, you know what, this is not fair. This is not right. Let's run and hide. Or let's just stand up and fight no matter what. 
Those thoughts have crossed my mind, and I'm sure it's crossed your mind. But as I look at the story of Jeremiah, you know, because I kept thinking as a pastor of two churches, you know, I don't want to make decisions on my emotions or decisions in what I think best, okay? But I need a story in the Bible. I need a situation in the Bible that I can see parallels with, with my current situation, and make my decisions from a biblical standpoint. Whether I like it or not. Whether I, it's not about me liking something. It's about, Lord, what can you teach us from your word? And let me walk in accordance to your word. I want things to go well with me, Lord. I want things to be good. I want your eyes upon me. Lord, even if I lose my privileges and my rights and my freedoms, I still want you to work in me and I want you to do something great in me. I want you to settle me. I want you to strengthen me. I want you to build me. And Lord, I want my descendants, I want my children to love you with all their hearts. I want my grandchildren to continue loving you with all my heart, with all their hearts, sorry. And I look at this story. Well, the people that are in that category are the good figs. The people in this category, the people of God, are the ones that said, you know what? I don't like it. I don't like being taken to captivity, but it's God's will. I'm just going to surrender to the situation. I'm going to give in to the captors. As long as God's eyes upon me, I'm happy to do this. And brethren, we are in a situation in 2020, 2021, where we can actually apply this. Okay? If you feel unsettled, I've got a way to settle you. It's to be one of the good figs. All right? And you may lose a lot. We may lose a lot. I don't know. I'm hoping things return to normal. Okay? I don't know. Okay? But think about this story. When you're unsettled. When you decide, you know what, I'm going to stay here, I'm going to fight no matter what, you know, this is not fair, I'm going to escape and run away, it's not going to end well for you. Especially, it's not going to end well for your children and your children's children. All right? We see this here in the Bible. And it's my job to just be a Jeremiah. It's my job just to preach God's word. It's your decision as to which basket of figs you want to be part of. The good figs, where God can use it, where God can strengthen you, where God will use your descendants to return and with a whole heart and serve God in a mighty, powerful way, or you decide to be someone that is a fighter, someone that says, no, I'm not, this is not fair, you run away, or whatever situation may be, you know, you end up as one of these evil figs, and you're going to lose your descendants. Your descendants are not going to be the people that return back to the Lord with a whole heart. Okay, let's pray.